There you go. Okay. You want to tell them about your book? You want to show them your book? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Are you going to help us learn about nonlinear dynamical systems? And operators? Can you say operators? Operators. Operators. You can't be so good at that. Can you say Leoville? I will. Okay, that, that's a pretty good one. All right, all right. That's a good job. All right, so. Uh, let's read this book. Welcome back to Data Driven Methods in Dynamical Systems. And today I'm going to talk to you about operators. Operators have been intimately tied with dynamical systems since the very beginning. In systems theory and control, the study of LTI systems really boils down to the study of operators over a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, namely the Hardy space. This could be the Hardy space of the half plane in the case of continuous time systems. The Laplace transform takes an L2 signal that goes from say zero to infinity and it maps that L2 signal to an analytic function on the right half of the complex plane. And a linear system which can be represented through a convolution now can be studied through what's called the transfer function, which comes from taking a Laplace transform of a convolution and it turns this convolution into a product. And so this becomes a multiplication operator. This is actually sort of at the core of all of systems theory and control, or at least for linear systems. There's tons of linear systems that people study out there. And in fact, many systems that are nonlinear are actually linearized when it comes to actually designing a controller. You see a lot of controllers like PID controllers being designed for quadcopters based on linearizations of the dynamics of their rotors. You even see linear control systems come up when you talk about, say, cooking in sort of modern ways, such as using, uh, say, sous vide. Where PID controllers are used to maintain a constant temperature in a water bath for, say, cooking steaks or other things, or, or even cooking your turkey for Thanksgiving. Now, I already mentioned in the last lecture how important quadcopters are for, say, YouTubers, video production. There's been quite a revolution in the control of quadcopters and their manufacture. But there are a lot of systems that are actually non-linear, or at least where linearizing your system could cause a lot of difficulty. And this can be seen through some very, very basic differential equations where you take a look at something like x dot is equal to 1 plus x squared. If we try to linearize that system, we lose a, an essential property of that system, which is called its finite escape time, which means that the system can blow up to infinity if we're not really careful. So that means a lot of classical systems theory is going to fall flat when it comes to doing a study of nonlinear systems. And so this class is mainly focused on nonlinear system theory. And in the summer, I'll add some more lectures talking about classical topics such as H infinity control and the Laplace transform and its relation to the Hardy space and control theory. For now, I want to talk to you about operators that we design for nonlinear systems. And these are going to be essentially densely defined operators. Now, I haven't told you what a bounded operator is yet, or even what an operator is yet. So why don't we go ahead and get started? If you've taken linear algebra, then you should be fairly familiar with operators. A linear operator on a vector space is a transformation where you can take two scalars, lambda and say mu, and two vectors, uh, say x and y out of Rn, or even infinite dimensional space, and that operation should split according to those scalars and those vectors. Now, if you're in a finite dimensional vector space, then this is a very, very simple problem. Everything becomes a matrix, all of the linear operators end up being continuous. However, most of the important linear operators that people study aren't actually continuous operators. And this includes, say, the operator of differentiation, where we can take a look at a vector space like L2 and take a representative of an element in there, say, the square root of x. And if you take the derivative of the square root of x, well, you don't get something as L2. In fact, the norm of that should be the integral of one over x, which is unbounded. And it's hard to argue that differential operators are important to study because we even teach them to high school students and they come up in physics and biology and mechanical engineering. And so we want to have some coherent way of talking about these, say, differential operators. The majority of the operators that we're going to be studying in this class are going to arise from differential operators over reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Because remember, we want to take samples in data science. You can't have samples 
without having a function space, and so we're going to use Reapers and kernel Hilbert spaces, uh, which lines up with the classical study of sample theory going back to Shannon, Hardy, and Nyquist. So we're going to start with a Hilbert space, and usually we're going to be talking about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So this means that we're going to have an inner product. That means that we're often going to have kernel functions. And we're going to talk about operators on these spaces. So a linear operator is something that is, say, linear in the way I described earlier. But when we talk about infinite dimensional spaces, we have to be careful about the domain of this operator. And so we're usually going to define this along with the operator itself. And so we'll say that an operator maps from the domain of that operator to the Hilbert space. And now a lot of times the domain is going to be very automatic in what we choose and the selection of domain is going to change different properties of our operators. In everything that we do in this class, we're going to use very particular domains and that's going to give us what are called closed operators and I'll tell you what those are in a minute. Now what we need to talk about are adjoints, we need to talk about closeness, and we need to talk about densely defined operators. And all of these properties depend on the domain. So first, let's talk about densely defined. An operator is said to be densely defined if the domain is actually dense inside the Hilbert space it's acting on. So for instance, if I take the exponential dot product kernel space, which is given in terms of power series with coefficients that should be little l2 in some sense. And so for the single variable exponential dot product kernel, we have a regular power series and we want the coefficients on our power series to satisfy the sum of a n squared times n factorial being less than infinity. This gives us the kernel function e to the x times y and in higher dimensions it'll be e to the x transpose y and sometimes we'll put a parameter mu in there as well. This is also called a Fox space when you consider it over complex numbers. An example of a densely defined operator then over this Hilbert space and I was very careful to give you the Hilbert space because there is no discussion of operators without talking about their underlying vector spaces. So an example of a, a well-defined densely defined operator is differentiation here. So if we take a power series out of our vector space and we take its derivative, we can easily demonstrate that the derivative of a power series is a power series again. But since we're increasing the coefficients on all of our ANs, it's not always going to land back in our space. However, we know that if we start with a polynomial, since that is a finite power series, and we take its derivative, we get another finite power series or another polynomial. Polynomials are dense inside the exponential dot product kernel's native space or the Fox space. And so now we can have a dense domain inside of our Hilbert space where our differentiation operator actually works. So we see that differentiation is actually a densely defined operator over the Fox space. So once you have a densely defined operator, you can go on and you can talk about the adjoint of these operators. Now the adjoint comes from the Reese representation theorem, where you take a look at members of your Hilbert space and you're looking at the functional that maps, say, G to your operator acting on G in a product with something else, uh, so, say H out of your Hilbert space. And you want to be able to move T onto H through an adjoint relation. You know, in finite dimensions, that would just be transposing the matrix and moving it over. Uh, and in this case, we have to be a little bit more careful. So the adjoint out operator is another operator where we have to keep careful track of its domain. However, its domain can be defined directly for, in terms of this relation. So if we take a look at that functional from before, we're gonna say that H is inside the domain of the adjoint of this operator if that functional is actually a bounded linear functional over our Hilbert space. That means that there is a unique function by the Reese representation theorem that represents that functional. And so then you can write the operator acting on G in a product with H is equal to G in a product with some other function in our space, call that capital H. Now what we see is that capital H can be defined as the adjoint of the operator acting on little h. And so today we have defined the mapping of the adjoint on a member inside of our Hilbert space. Now we would like to figure out if this adjoint itself is going to be densely defined. And in order to get that sort of guarantee, we need another idea, and this is called closeness. 
So like I said, these operators aren't gonna be continuous because say differentiation isn't gonna work on every single member of your space. So we're gonna aim for the next best thing. And this comes from the notion of a closed graph out of say elementary calculus, where basically we're gonna say that a graph of our function should not have any holes. What this means from a convergence perspective is that if you're converging inside the domain and you see that the image of the sequence inside your domain is also converging underneath this operator, then that means that the domain is converging to a member of that operator's domain and that the image is also converging to the image of that limit. And so when you have a, an operator like this, then that means that the adjoint is not only gonna be densely defined, but it is also gonna be closed. So to recap, if we have a densely defined operator and it is closed, its adjoint is also densely defined and closed. And you can find more details on this in Pedersen's analysis now. All right, so now I wanna take this and connect it back to dynamical systems. And so I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about n-dimensional spaces and we're not going to talk about just differentiation but we're going to talk about what are called Lieville operators. So I'm going to take this differentiation operator and we're going to take it a step further. And so we're going to have a dynamical system say x dot is equal to f of x and we're going to have a trajectory from our system and this is going to be gamma of t going from say 0 to capital T and mapping to Rn. Now if I take some member of our Hilbert space and and so this is a Hilbert space over Rn. It doesn't have to be the exponential dot product kernel space. It can be any of these spaces, provided that we have continuously differentiable functions. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna compose G with gamma. We're trying to come up with what this operator should look like. If I take the derivative of that, then I'm gonna get what's called the orbital derivative, or essentially the chain rule. And so the derivative with respect to t of g composed with gamma of t is gonna be equal to the gradient of g composed with gamma of t times gamma dot of t. But gamma dot of t is supposed to be a trajectory for the system so we can replace it with f of gamma of t. And so now we have the time derivative of g at gamma of t is equal to the, the gradient of g of gamma of t times f of gamma of t. And I want to turn this into an operator over the whole space. And so I'm going to take my trajectory out of there. I'm going to replace it with a state. And that gives us our Lieville operator. Our Lieville operator is now going to be defined as a sub f acting on g is equal to the gradient of g at x times f of x. And of course, we have to be careful about the domain. And so I'm going to choose the domain of this operator to be the collection of all of our members of our Hilbert space, such that this formal expression resides back in the Hilbert space itself. And so today I have given you a full definition of what is called a Lieville operator. Now, are there any densely defined Lieville operators? Yes, absolutely there are. If you take f to be a polynomial and you take a look at our exponential dot product kernel space, then again, since we're gonna be taking a gradient of a, of a polynomial, we're gonna get a polynomial back. And when we multiply by a polynomial or a vector of polynomials in this case, then that's gonna slam together and give you a, a polynomial expression. And so we know that as long as f is at the very least a polynomial, then this Lieville operator is densely defined over the exponential dot product kernel space and many others. It turns out that the exponential dot product kernel space facilitates many other kinds of dynamics that aren't just polynomial. Uh, and so we can use things like sines and exponentials and other things like that. But for the most part, a lot of our systems that we're gonna be studying do come from polynomial systems, but it's good to know that the theory itself is way more general. And this gives us an advantage over spaces like the space of continuous functions, where when we where when people study Lieville operators over those spaces, they're restricted to moment problems. And then that forces them to look at only polynomial dynamics. And so posing this over reproducing kernel Hilbert space can give you a lot more flexibility over other spaces, such as spaces of continuous functions, but also with Hilbert spaces, we get projections and other things like that. Now, let me give you the, the one core piece here that is gonna connect the rest of data science. And we're gonna be using this identification over and over again. And that comes from occupation kernels. So last time we talked about occupation kernels that corresponded to trajectories from the system, and that's what we called gammas. But occupation kernels themselves don't depend on the trajectory being part of a dynamical system at all. They can correspond to any sort of continuous signal. And it turns out that each of these occupation kernels is in the domain of every single densely defined Lieville operator. And that is gonna 
be extremely helpful when we start taking a look at different sort of data methods. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about inner products that we can put on spaces of dynamical systems, which is ultimately going to lead us to a weak version of the Cindy algorithm, where we end up using a lot of test functions. And this corresponds to a paper we published back in 2018. And when it comes to dynamic mode decomposition, we're going to use special relations that we get when the signal itself is actually a trajectory for the system. And that's going to give us a relationship between occupation kernels and regular kernel functions. And so before I leave you here, let me tell you what happens in the case of having a trajectory for the system. So if we have a trajectory for the system and we take a look at this occupation kernel, then what ends up happening is when you take the adjoint of that Leoval operator on that occupation kernel, what you end up getting is you have the integral of AF acting on G of gamma of T integrated DT. And that's when you take this sort of inner product of AFG with our occupation kernel. But what's really cool here is that once you put the trajectory back in the system, then that means that AFG composed with gamma of T is actually the gradient of G composed with gamma of T times F of gamma of T. And F of gamma of T is gamma dot. And that means that this whole expression is just the integral of G prime of gamma of T. And so then what we end up having is that this expression can integrate and it becomes G of gamma of big T minus G of gamma of zero. And so that means that the adjoint of AF acting on our occupation kernel gives us the difference of two kernels, one centered at the end point of our trajectory and one centered at the beginning of our trajectory. And this is the pivotal relation that we're gonna use throughout the rest of the class. So tune in next time and we're gonna define a special inner product on dynamical systems that give rise to densely defined Liouville operators. And that's gonna require occupation kernels, adjoints on that occupation kernels, and it will ultimately lead to a parameter identification routine. And before you go, if you wanna learn more about operators and say bounded operators, I have a research video I posted back at the very beginning of the semester. And there I give a complete description of what are called multiplication operators and bounded multiplication operators over a variety of spaces. One of these being the Hardy space, but also the Fox space and some special space I made up, which is called the poly logarithmic Hardy space. And so with that, now you know what densely defined operators are, closed operators, adjoints of operators, and if you go watch those videos, you'll know what bounded operators are. Now, we're going to build up slowly to what is called dynamic mode decomposition, which uses these Liouville operators and occupation kernels to decompose a continuous time dynamical system. And it's gonna require some spectral theory and some special notions of finite rank representations. So I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, take care. Hey, buddy. Bye-bye. Okay, hey, yeah, push button.